Kung mapapansin niyo mga kapatid, kung mapapansin niyo mga kapatid, yung ginamit ko dito, the sun of righteousness, S-U-N, pagsinig po din yan, hindi po S-O-N, S-U-N, sun yung araw. Because under the sun, nothing is hidden. Wala pong may tatago under the sun. Lahat po ay mag-reveal under the sun. At ang darkness, hindi magbawagi sa light. Ito po. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go out and live like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under your souls, under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Ito po, ang mahal. Dito. Remember, remember, lagi-lagi po nyo, alalahanin nyo, or uh, remember the law of my servant Moses. The decrees and laws I gave him at Korah to all Israel. To all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So makita tayo dito, nakikita po natin dito mga kapatid, yung kaisipan ng Panginoon. Yung heart ng Panginoon, pinakita niya po rito. Marami pong message ito, kung magbubulay-bulayan natin ito, marami pa po tayong mapapalabas na kaisipan ng Panginoon. Yung gusto, gusto ng Panginoon na mangyari sa atin sa mga araw na to, na tayo po ay gagather niya as one nation, the remnant of Israel, hindi, pa, hindi po tayo uh, malayo sa kanila mga kapatid. So ito po, salamat, salamat sa na kayo po ay naririto at naging bahagi ng ating pong uh, seminar na ito. Thank you very much. We welcome you and God bless you. from our speaker. Uh, anyway, uh, our brother Joseph Domon is from Canada. Uh, he is a member of this quiet small meeting. And uh, Oops. Uh, I will be on the floor with him. So we could start with him. Uh, yung po natin is to play the end from the video. Uh, yung first way we have been on that in this to be disciples. Where are we now in this end time events? Kung saan na pa tayo ngayon? Ano ba nang nangyari na yan? So makita natin talaga something is going on. Explain nga yan ni Brother Joseph Domon kung nasama tayo ng Michael Sato. Uh, Brother Joseph Domon, please take the floor. You take the floor, please. Are you asking me to take over there, Leo? Yes, you can take okay. note. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
Shalom, everyone, and uh, I want to thank you for coming today and uh, allowing me to share what I'm going to share with you. And I want to thank uh, uh, Pastor Leo, Pastor Rafi, and uh, the others who've helped organize this and make this possible. Um, my Filipino is not very good yet, um, but I am practicing a little bit. And I was able to catch some of the things that Pastor Rafi was saying. Um, I want you to understand what he just read to you in, in Malachi 4. And we're going to put that up on the screen here so you can read it with us. And it's something to, to keep in mind. So, Randy, you want to throw that up on the screen? Thank you. Remember the laws of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel. With the statutes and the judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great dreadful day of the Lord. Now, right now, there's a number of people around the world that are claiming to be Jesus or potentially the, the Messiah. So if they're here, then the question is, where's Elijah? Where is he? So there's a number of other people that are claiming to be Elijah. Um, so there's a couple of things to be looking for. And But here's what Elijah is supposed to be doing. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Or I will come and strike the earth with a curse. Well, the earth is being struck with a curse right now. It's called COVID-19. So when I read that verse there, the hearts of the chill of the father to the children, I read that as the hearts of our father, God in heaven. Now, if I call him by his name, Jehovah, please don't get offended. That's just what I call him. Um, if you call him by a different name, that's great. But I, if I say Jehovah, I'll, I'll try not to offend anybody. But our Father God in heaven, we're going to turn his heart towards us. And we're going to turn our hearts toward him. And if we don't do that, then he's not going to turn his heart towards us. And he's going to come and strike the earth with a curse. Which brings us to you. Are you free of COVID-19? Are you free of uh, the plagues that are coming? Are you free of the plagues that are already here? Randy, you can go back and get ready to go to that other chart now. I have a message that I normally take about 40 hours to present. Leo has heard my message. He's seen a lot of my stuff. He knows what I'm talking about. Uh, Pastor Rafi has been learning it, and he's, I think he's starting to see it as well. So we're going to present some things here to you today, and I want you to try and understand. I'm just going to be hitting on the highlights because I don't have enough time until I come, and I do plan on coming. But the things we're going to be talking about, it's, very, it's a very big subject. So I heard Pastor Rafi talking to you and saying that, you know, we are in the last days. How do you know that? Because people have been saying that forever. They've been saying, you know, ever since Jesus was here, they've been expecting the Messiah to show up at any time. So I've been given this understanding. Maybe, Randy, I'll get you to go to 2 Kings 19. So Randy's going to be jumping all over the place here for me. Um, we're going to go 2 Kings 19.29. And this is a key verse to understand. So those of you that are pastors there, this is the verse you want to mark in your Bible. 2 Kings 19.29. Leo, if you're having a problem there or they don't understand what I'm I'm showing them, just tell me to stop and we'll go back and repeat. I, I've got all the day, all the time in the world. Verse 29, this shall be a sign to you. Now, first of all, a sign is, is a sign between you and God. There's the mark of the beast, the mark of Satan, which everyone says is 666, and they're talking about the sign on your hand, Satan's mark. They're going to put a, a chip in there or going to do something in your hand and then on your forehead. Well, the mark of Satan 
to understand what that mark is, you got to know what God's mark is. And God's mark, he's giving you a thing here, is his sign. His sign is the Sabbath and the holy days of Leviticus 23. Satan's sign is any other day but those signs. Any other day but the Sabbath and the holy days. So that's just a, that's a whole other teaching on its own. This shall be a sign to you. So he's talking about something to do with the Sabbath. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself. So whatever he's talking to Hezekiah, who's about to be attacked by the Assyrians. And they're threatening to attack the city and they've written this letter and they've boasted against God. And now Hezekiah has pleaded and prayed to God. And this is God's answer to him. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself. That means you're not planting this year, but whatever grows you can eat. And in the second year, what springs from the same. So that means in the second year, you can eat whatever grows of the ground, but you're not planting. And in the third year, you're going to plant or you're going to sow and you're going to reap. You're going to plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So this is the most undisputed date in history when this event took place. This is 701 BC. 701 BC. And when I read that, I saw the 49th year and the 50th year Jubilee, which is in Leviticus 25, the 49th and the 50th year Jubilee. And I knew that the date that this took place on was, on, was 701 BC. So with just this information, just this information alone, you can count every sabbatical year starting from 701 BC going forward um, until our time now, right? And from 701 BC, you can go backwards and have every sabbatical year going back in history. So I did that and I put it on the chart. Uh, there's a few other steps in here that you have to figure out and I don't think we're gonna have time to do that. That could be another teaching on how to figure this all out. We do have that in our book. But Randy, you want to go to the chart there? What I did was I figured out when the sabbatical and jubilee years are. So if 701 is the 49th year and the 50th year is 700 BC, when you count backwards in time, you can hit every sabbatical and jubilee year. And when you count forward in time, you can hit every sabbatical and jubilee year. So I laid this all out in the chart. And then I went to uh, Genesis and I began reading the, the times of uh, Adam and Seth and all his sons down to Noah and from Noah down to Abraham. And that chronology is there for anybody to, can, to do. Any pastor can do this. Any person with a Bible can do this. You just plot them there and start adding up the dates. So I did that. And we started with the creation of Adam. So in Genesis 6, verse 3, just leave that chart there, Randy. You don't have to move that one. Genesis 6, verse 3. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis 6, verse 3. There goes one of the pages of my Bible. Genesis 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man. Now, this word man, if you look it up in the Hebrew, means mankind. Okay, with, with Adam. So with all of Adam's mankind forever. I'm not going to strive with them forever. For he is indeed flesh, and yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, how many do you know, how many people do you know live to be 120 years? We don't have anybody living that long. It's pretty neat when we find someone living over 100. In North America, most people live to be somewhere in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I would say that's pretty much the rule everywhere in the world. So what happened there? Are we trying to average that, you know, they lived to be 900 years before the flood. Are we trying to average their lives with our lives? And that's about 120. If you, again, 
in order to study your Bible, you must go back to the original language and see what the original language meant. It says 120 years. That word years is the word shana. 120 shana. And the word shana means cycles of time. So 120 cycles of time from the creation of Adam, which I have here as, as year one, if you can all see that. Um, can you see that there, Leo? Is that plain for everyone to see? Yes, yes, please. Okay. It's very clear. So if, if you can point out year one, so everyone's looking at it, that's the year that Adam is created. Now, we just did a little movie on this about where's the Garden of Eden, and it's very beautiful, some of the pictures from the Garden of Eden. Um, you can go there and look at that. It's on my website, sightedmoon.com. So if you look at this, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the very first column, and then it goes over 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then up to 21, up to 28, up to 35, up to 42, and up to 49. That is one complete Jubilee cycle. Now, is the 50th year, do we start counting one after that, or is the 50th year the first year in the next cycle? That's a question, and we can prove it to you. We're not going to have enough time today to go through all the proofs. So I'm going to tell you that we did both. We tried it both ways, 49 or 50 years. Which is it? And we proved it and can prove it that it's 49. And then the 50th year is also the first year. When you count Pentecost Sunday, you count 50 days from the, 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 the day after the weekly Sabbath during the Days of Unleavened Bread, you count 50 days and you end up on the 50th day being Pentecost Sunday. It's, and Pentecost Sunday is the first day of the week. So the first day of the week is like the first year in the next Jubilee cycle. So year 50, as you can see here, is also the first year in the next Jubilee cycle. Again, we have 89 sabbatical and Jubilee year proofs that we have found from artifacts, history, and your Bible. And they all line up with each other. And if they all line up with each other, then we are able to prove whether it's a 49 or a 50 year Jubilee cycle. And that's important. So you take 49 years and write this down, 49 years times 120. And that will give you 5,880 years. Now everyone's looking for 6,000 years, but they don't know where it starts, where it ends. And they're guessing. A lot of pastors are out there saying that the rapture was going to be in 2011 uh, at the Feast of Pentecost and then at the Feast of uh, uh, Sukkot and or the Feast of Tabernacles. And then there was going to be the rapture is going to take place at the end of the Mayan calendar. And then the rapture is going to take place when uh, Jupiter was inside this constellation Virgo and it stayed there for nine months. And at the end of that nine months, it's going to come out. And it's like it's coming out, giving birth. And that's when the Messiah is going to come back. That was in September of uh, uh, what 2017 or 18. I forget what year that was. But people are always guessing about when the Messiah is coming back. And I want to encourage you. I want to, everyone that's listening to this, I want to encourage you. We have an interview coming up on May 16th. And the information they are going to present is absolutely stunning. So I want to encourage you, if you can tune in to our YouTube channel, uh, we have a meeting come up May 16th. I'm, I know it blew my mind when I saw it. It's going to blow your mind. Um, so now let's go to, stay right where we are there, Randy. We're going to go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, verse 15 and 17. We're going to look at something that, you, that God's talking about here and understand what he means. Genesis 2, verse 15 and 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to, the, to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the Garden of Eden you may freely eat, but 
of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we know that Adam and Eve ate of the tree. What we don't know is, is the exact year that they did it. I've got some speculations on that year, but I can't prove it. But I, I, can, I can theorize on it. So the day that Adam ate it, did he die? Well, first of all, Cain and Abel aren't born yet. And they were born be before Seth. And Seth was born when Adam was 130 years old. So he didn't die before Cain and Abel was born. And he didn't die. Just scroll up a little bit, Randy. There's 130. That's when Seth was born. So before Seth was Cain and Abel. And before that, Adam and Eve ate of this tree. When? Well, Adam and Eve got to mature in the garden a little bit. So I'm going to, I got a date that I've picked out, but I can't prove it. But he didn't die. In the day that you eat of this, you're going to die. So God is saying something to Adam. It's not the physical 24-hour day. Because we know that Adam lived to be 930 years. So Andy, scroll. Just If you look, hang on, Randy, go back. On the left-hand side in the green, you can see the year one, uh, one, two, and three. That's a jubilee cycle. So that's one jubilee, two jubilees, three jubilee cycles right here. And we're going to continue to count them throughout all of history and see where we are. So scroll up to the time when Adam dies in the year 930 after, the, after his creation. Right there. 930 years after the creation of Adam is in the 19th Jubilee cycle. So he did not die on the very same day. Now, if Randy scrolls up a little bit more. Okay, so this here is the end in 981 years after the creation of Adam. That's the end of the first millennial day. The first millennial day. That's when Adam died. So now, Randy, I want you to go to the, on the, your, your charts at the bottom. You know, the, yeah, that's it. Click on that one. Open that up so they can see the whole thing, please. Zoom out. Okay, good. Just scroll down or slide it down. Yeah, right there. Okay, so you can see the first millennial day in green on the left-hand column. That's 20 Jubilee cycles from the creation of Adam until he died in the year 930, which you can see is 931 there. That's the start of the next Jubilee cycle. 980 is the end of the first millennial day. If you count those millennial days, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And in the book of Hebrews, it talks about entering into his rest. So God is saying in the book of Hebrews, we're not going to go there today, but you can go there and read it, that they were not worthy of entering into his rest because they wouldn't obey him. And Paul's, I believe it's Paul, but we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, is saying, don't you miss or make the same mistake as they did and not enter that rest. That rest, the seventh millennium, is just like the weekly Sabbath. Okay, so what year is this? Now, Randy, just scroll down below to the chart below. Here we have all those years in, in Gregorian years. Down a little bit, Randy. No, yep, right there. In the yellow, you can see the year 2044. So since the creation of Adam back in 3788 BC, to the year 2044, where we are just about to, we're in the year 2021 now. We're that close to the seventh millennium. 
we're that close. So yeah, some people are gonna start thinking, okay, it's 2021. So that gives us 23 more years. Okay, that's correct. That's when the seventh millennium begins. But there's a whole lot of things that are gonna take place before that, such as the great tribulation, such as the three and a half years when the two witnesses are, are warning the world uh, and there's no rain on the world, that's, that's seven years. And then there's the 2300 days that I talk about in Daniel 8 to, to take place. So somewhere between 2044 and 2021, all these terrible end time things have to happen. And I'm here. I was up there to see Leo in 2015, I think it was. And I came back to Mindanao in 2018 to tell you how little time we have left and to tell those people at that time what the purpose of the Filipino people is. So now we know what a millennial day is. We want to go and look at, um, let's go to Daniel 9 now. And Randy, if you can pull that up on the screen. Uh, the verse first, and then we'll come back to these charts in a moment. Daniel 9, verse 24. Okay, well, I should turn it in my Bible so I can read it. Daniel 9, verse 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Everybody out there is saying that this, these four verses in 24, 25, 26, and 27 are all talking about the coming of Jesus in the year 27 AD. So the question I ask people who say this is, if you're correct, and some of you may believe that this is talking about the coming of Jesus, why did none of the apostles ever speak about this to prove that he was the Messiah that they were talking about. Not one of the apostles did it. Not one of the 5,000 did it afterwards that we know of. The first time anyone used this prophecy to talk about the Messiah was Rabbi Akiva. He was trying to prove that Simon Bar Kopa was the Messiah in the year 133 A.D. Well, Simon Bar Kopa died in that revolt, and Rabbi Akiva was uh, then later killed. So this didn't prove that the Rabbi, uh, Simon Bar Kopa was the Messiah. Fifty years later, the church fathers began to believe that this was talking about Jesus. And by the time we get to Julius Africanus in the year 2, uh, 202, 220 A.D., He's now said that this is talking about the Messiah and that he's going to come back in about 500 years time. And that's where we get what we call today is the gap theory, where Jesus could come back at any moment. And we have to be ready all the time because he's going to be here at any moment. And it's not true. He's not coming at just any time. He's coming at a very specific time. And we're going to talk about that in the second teaching this afternoon or this morning. Uh, no man can know the day or the hour. We're going to talk about that because some of you are going to say, well, how can you know this? Because he said that. And well, just the fact that you're asking that question, you don't know what that means is telling you something. We'll talk about that later. So then getting back to verse 24, is transgression still going on in the world? Yes. Uh, 
have people are people still sinning? Yes. Uh, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Okay, his blood on the cross. Okay, maybe. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Where is that? Are all the Filipinos righteous? Are all the Canadians righteous? Are all the Americans? Are all the Europeans? Are all the Africans? Is the whole world righteous? Is it really, it really going to take him that long to bring it in? Or is he going to bring it in like this? Is he not God? Why is it taking so long? Well, he didn't bring in righteousness yet. To seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. To are there no more prophets after Jesus came? Well, that's not true because we know the apostles were prophesying. The apostle John in 90 AD wrote the book of Revelations. So he's prophesying in the book of Revelations. We know that Peter prophesied. I'm trying to think if Paul did. I'm, I would imagine he did. I'm not sure about that. So the prophecy part wasn't sealed up. This is not talking about Jesus. Then who's it talking about? 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your most holy place. The word weeks here, go back, it's, uh, oh, there goes my brain. It's 70, 70, shibuyim, shibuyim. And it means shabua. Thank you, Randy. Hold that word up there so you can see it again. 70 Shabua. So now we go and look up this word Shabua. I don't, can everyone see it there, Leo? Yes. Okay. We look up the word Shabua and we see where Daniel has written about it before, because Daniel's the one writing this, and we see where this word is used before. And every time this word is used, except for, I think, two places, it means the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks. Daniel was told to write this book and then seal it up for the end time. Seal it up so people could read it but not know what it meant. And they wouldn't know what it meant until the end times. We are in the end times. And I'm going to prove that to you. I've already shown you, but I'm about to prove it to you now. Because we are in those end times, when you leave today, you should be on fire to warn your family, to warn your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your brethren, to warn your village, to warn your city, to warn your entire nation as to just how close we are to the end. Don't look at 2044 and say we got 21 or 23 years. Because as you start to count down how much time things take, and right now, COVID-19 is the start. We've been saying here at Sighted Moon for 15, 16 years now that 2020 was the start. And here it is. So, you know, I came there in 2015. I told Leo. I came there in 2018. I told um, Pastor Dennis. I went down to Dago City. I told him there. I've been telling uh, Pastor Ike. The same thing since 2015, 2020, things were going to start. And lo and behold, we have a worldwide epidemic of COVID going on. And right now, India is having what you call a 9-11, where over 3,000 people are dying every single day. Every single day. And they got 350,000 new cases, 400,000 new cases every day now. The Philippines has been spared that. Amen. Amen. Jehovah is doing a blessing on the Philippines, and you guys don't even know it. You just had a monster hurricane go up your coast and not come ashore. Amen. Amen. He's going to be doing a work in the Philippines, and I hope we have time for me to talk about that before we close out today.
there's a role in the Philippines that's in the Bible talking about what the Philippines are supposed to be doing. And he's pouring out his spirit on all flesh in these last days. So you need to take advantage of that and, and get as much of that spirit into you now in order to keep the Philippines protected from the next monster typhoon, from the next monster earthquake or tsunami or whatever disaster. It's just waiting to come and take away those people who don't want to obey. Verse 25, how do we know that we are talking about 70? So 70 times 49, okay? 70 times 49 is 3,430 years. Where, what does, where does that fit in? I don't know. He's about to tell you in verse 25 where to find the answers to what I'm saying. Because people take this and they apply it to Yeshua or Jesus, and they say that that is the year that, um, oh, Randy, what's the guy's name? Ah, the, the Persian king. I can't remember his name. I'm sorry. I'm say say what, Leo? Okay, I'm not the only one that's forgetting. Um, anyway, it starts with the Persian king and they in the four 455, um, and they count four uh, from there, and they end up at 27 AD. And that or 27 or 28 or 29, depending on what you know theory you're doing, and that's when this is applying to Jesus. Okay, King they Darius. always King Darius. King Darius, thank you. Yes. So, verse 25 is the part they have trouble with, and therefore, and under no therefore. So you're supposed to know. You're supposed to understand. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, that was to uh, exerces, exerces. Some people use Darius, exerces, uh, somebody use other, another one, and they count from there is, uh, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, Messiah, Jesus, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And they count 69 weeks or 69 years or 69 times seven to give 483 years to the time when Jesus came in 27 AD. So they take 27, they go back and it's almost ex exorcises, right? That's what they're thinking. But it doesn't say 69, it says 7. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince. That word Messiah means is Mashiach in Hebrew. It means the anointed in Hebrew. Okay? If I poured oil on top of Leo or if I poured oil on top of uh, Pastor Rafi, I will have been, they will have been anointed and I will have anointed them. I will have messiahed them. It's the same word. In English, we put a capital there to make it somebody important. But in Hebrew, there are no capitals. Until the anointed prince. Now, is Jesus your anointed prince? He's not my anointed prince. Yeshua, y Yeshua, Jesus, is my king. He's not a prince. He's a king. Who's this talking about then? Okay, so first of all, from the going forth of the command, where is this going to go? I want to go to open up your Bibles, and we're going to start reading the command to go. Wow, my time's flying by. I got to go fast here. How much extra can I go over, Leo? Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> okay, Exodus 3. We got to go quick. 
Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So there's the first time that God is telling Moses to go get the people. Exodus 3, or yeah, Exodus 3, verse 12. So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. There he is sending him again. When you have brought out the people out of Egypt, you shall serve the God in this mountain. Verse 16, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, that's the third time he's being told. Verse 17, and I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt and to the land of the Canaanites and Hittites. That's the fourth time. Verse 18, then they will heed your voice and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, the Lord, the God, Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go. Let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. That's one, two, three, four, that's five. Chapter four, verse 12. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what to say. That's six. Verse 19, chapter four. Now the Lord said to Moses and Median, go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Daniel 9 is talking about God giving the command to Moses to go and get his people. It's not Exerces, it's not Aharius, it's not Darius, it's God telling Moses to go and get his people. So the 70 weeks starts there. Okay, Randy, pull up the chart where Moses is given the, the, the Exodus. And we're going to prove this to you right now, because the very first part of this verse is, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem is until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks. When did Jesus restore Jerusalem? Randy, I want the charts, please. When did Jesus build Jerusalem? Okay, I want the left-hand side, Randy, if you can open that up a little bit bigger or uh, zoom in on it, I mean. One more. Another one. Can you get one more? Yep. Uh, no. Uh, no, you got to zoom out one. Just zoom out one. One click. This is the, okay, so again, there's a lot more research that we're not really explaining here now. We just don't have time. Again, this is a 40-hour teaching that I present, and I'm trying to do it with you in less than an hour, and I got seven minutes left <laughs> or more. Um, the Exodus took place in the year 1379 BC. Again, we can prove this with the Jubilee Cycles. This is the countdown starting at the Exodus. We start counting because Moses is told, or no, Daniel is told from the Exodus, count seven. So in 1386 is the start of this Jubilee cycle. So if we count, it says, we, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Count seven Jubilee cycles. And I, the numbers in the middle, the one, two, you can count them with them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven Jubilee cycles have now passed. 1043, scroll up one more. We're now starting into the eighth Jubilee cycle. There shall be seven weeks, seven Jubilee cycles. And then Messiah the Prince shall show up. Messiah the Prince is Messiah King David, who was born in the year 1040 BC. He was anointed Samuel when he was a little boy. And then he was made king over Judah in 1010. 
And then he was made king over all of Israel seven years later in 1003 BC. This verse in Daniel 9, verse 25, is talking about King David. And King David came on the scene. He is our anointed prince, not Yeshua. He's my king. Yeshua is my king. David is our prince. There shall be seven weeks. That's seven jubilee cycles. At seven times 49, or seven times the Feast of Shavuot, or seven times uh, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Oaths. And then it says 62 weeks. So now, if you would just count 62 weeks, just start scrolling up, Randall, or Randy, until you get to uh, the 69th year. So you can see that they're going, number them all the way along, just go a little slower. So people can count them with you. Keep going. And you can see we're counting just the Jubilee cycles. We're at 28. We're at 32. And they keep coming. And they keep coming. And we're at 44 now. Now we're at 60. And the 69th Jubilee cycle is starting in the year stop after 69. The 69th Jubilee cycle ends in 1996. This prophecy in Daniel 9, 25, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, seven Jubilee cycles, and 62 weeks or 62 Jubilee cycles which brings us that 69 in total from the going forth of the command when Jehovah God told Moses to go and get his people. David rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. David rebuilt the Milo. David rebuilt the ramparts. Not Yeshua, not Jesus. David did. And after 62 weeks, after 69 weeks in total, our prince is going to come in the very near future. The 70th Jubilee cycle that Daniel 9 is talking about is the same 120th Jubilee cycle since the creation of Adam that we spoke about in Genesis 6-3. Right there in the middle is the year 2020 that we've been warning you about. Now, let's read. And after 62 weeks, okay, so after 1996, Messiah shall be cut off. So does that mean that Jesus is going to get killed again? No, because this is not talking about Jesus. This word Messiah is the Mashiach, the anointed. Who are his anointed? Israel. All 12 tribes are the anointed. They are the apple of God's eye. They are going to be cut off because they are not keeping the commandments and they are not obeying God. So they're about to be cut off. And I'm not just talking about the state of Israel. This is, again, this is a 40-hour teaching, and I'm just giving you the highlights. So we do about a six-hour teaching on exactly who Israel is, and we follow them through history. We can do that by name. Israel today is the United States and United Kingdom. Israel today is also the state of Israel. And they're going to be cut off, but not for himself. So that not for himself is a, when you look up the Hebrew, means they will be cut off and be as if they never were. And I know in the Philippines, you depend on the U.S. military to protect your islands out there from the Chinese. So you got something to think about because the U.S. is going to be gone here very soon. And the people of the prince who is to come. Who is that? Well, people understand that to be Satan. Shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the sanctuary here is the word. Um, uh, it means saints. Right? You look up the Hebrew word. It means saints. Destroy the city and the saints. And the end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. 
Again, this is a 40 hour teaching. I'm just giving you the highlights. We're out of time. This covenant made with many is the United Nations covenant of the United Nations Environmental Program. When I was there before, I spoke with uh, um, Pastor Jeremiah Belkaka, who is now a, uh, working for President Duterte with his brother and his father. The covenant made with many is the UNEP, which was then changed to the um, uh, Rio Accord, then the Rio Plus 20, then the Kyoto Accord, Agenda 21. They keep changing the name. And the latest one that it was called was the Paris Accord, which President Trump voted to get out of when he came into office. Now President uh, Biden is vote going to re-sign on to it. What's wrong with this? Saving the planet, saving the trees, saving the whales. It's good. That's good. But what do whales and panda bears and, and uh, polar bears, what do they have to do with human rights? Because this covenant that the United Nations has put out, made with every nation in the world today, it started out with 113 in June 6th to 16th, 1972. So if you look at 1972 there and you count 49 years later, it brings you to 2020. The United Nations lost the Americans in 2020. That's when that agreement, President Trump signed it into law in 2016. It took four years for it to become law, which is 2020. Europe has lost the United Kingdom, who have come out of Brexit at December 31st, 2020. They're no, part of, no longer a part of all the U European rules and regulations. So in 2011, this covenant made with many, who's about the environment saving the whales, who made their first, first law about human rights, said that the LGBTQ have human rights and that we need to support them. And starting in 2011, when they passed this law at the United Nations, our leaders began to go out and promote human rights everywhere. President uh, Obama, my prime minister Trudeau, pushing the, not human rights, but the LGBTQ rights. Because if they're pushing human rights, they would have gone into China and helped the people there. They would have gone into the Middle East and helped the people there, but they didn't. Your nation had a law that they were trying to pass called the Sogi Law. It was defeated, then it was revoted, then it was, I think, defeated again. And President Duterte was going to let it go, and then a big storm came and hit his city down there in Mindanao and flooded the city, and a number of people died, and then they had that big fire in Mindanao. And Senator Belkaka told uh, President Duterte, you can't go ahead with this gay rights law because bad things are starting to happen. They're hitting your city. It's a sign to you. And President Duterte started to listen then. So this is the covenant made with many. It, it ends in 2020, but other things are starting to happen. Then shall he, he should confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, in the middle of the Jubilee cycle, in the middle of the 70th week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And right now, churches around the world have shut down. You're not allowed to go to church. You're not allowed to assemble. I see some of you are assembling here, but a lot of places around the world, you're not allowed to do that. Is that what this talk about? Maybe. And on the wings of abomination shall he take, shall, shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So we're gonna wrap this up now. We are now in the year 2021. There's a curse. There are four curses in Leviticus 26. One comes in the first uh, sabbatical cycle, which you see the first cycle there, 1996 to 2002. I call it the curse of terror. Leviticus 26, 14. You can go there and read it. That's your homework assignment. Then the second curse, the first curse I call terror. We have uh, the United States embassies being destroyed in Tanzania and uh, Kenya, 1998. 2000, the USS Cole is attacked by a suicide bomber. 
2001, 9-11 happens and the world changed. And the United States went into one of its longest wars ever for 13 years that they're just coming out of now. The next curse is I'm gonna make your skies like iron. Well, why don't we just go there and read it? Leviticus 26. So we read the, we did the first one already. Uh, verse 16. I will also do this to you. I will even appoint terror of you. Oh, if we yeah, yeah, I'll appoint terror of you and wasting disease. So wasting disease, fever, which you shall consume the eyes and cause sore of the heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, and your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And if by this, so this is the second curse, and if by this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. So that seven times is referring to a jubilee or a sabbatical cycle. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. So that's drought and famine. So we've had the hottest years ever recorded between 20, 2003 and 2009. And since then, since 2009, we've had even hotter years up until 2020, which is now amongst the hottest years ever recorded. So each of these curses is compounded and doesn't go away. They stick with us until the end. Uh, verse 21, then if you walk contrary to me and not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will send wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children. This is, these wild beasts are like bacteria and viruses. So they start in the third sabbatical cycle. We had SARS, MERS, bird flu, H1N1, H1N3, H5N1, swine flu, and now COVID-19. But we're only at the third curse. COVID-19 started in 2020, but there's others before that. Verse 23, and if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you, and I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will bring a sword on you. And when I was there with Leo, I told Leo that the Philippines was going to war with ISIS. And the next year you did. Howie. Marawi, yeah. But this is talking about a bigger war than that because the world is going to go to war with Islam. And I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. And you, when you are gathered together within your cities, I will send a pestilence among you. Where is everyone gathered right now? In their houses, in their homes. And you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have cut off your supply of bread. So here's a warning. And I've been telling Leo this to take warning. There is a famine coming. Mm -hmm. It's coming. You need to get ready. You have very little time left. When I've cut off your supply of bread, 10 women. This doesn't mean you can have 10 wives. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying that 10 women will want to bake your bread because there's no food for all of them. There's only enough food for one, and the 10 of them are going to work on it. In one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight. So I'd say, you know, that's a muffin. One muffin. You know, that might be general, that might be one muffin per family. I don't know. Verse 27, after all this, if you're not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you in fury. Now God is ticked off. And I, God, I, Jehovah, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses in on the lifeless forms of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about all 12 tribes. Again, 
We've skipped over that part here. This is a 40 hour teaching in one hour. The two witnesses are going to come on the world scene. We're in the year 2021. It is my belief, and this is what I'm teaching. And I'll, Leo, can I have a couple more minutes? Okay, go ahead, please. Randy, scroll down to uh, the flood of Noah, please. All the way down, all the way down, blue section. There you go, yep. Uh, I don't, no, get on the other side there. I need the other side. I think that's your post. <laughs> go to the right side, yeah. Uh, 16, go up, go up, go up, go up, 1656. Okay, right there, blue. You'll notice that this is when the flood took place, 16, 1656 years after the creation of Adam. It's in the sixth sabbatical cycle. Okay? Just note that. I want to put that in your brain. It's in the sixth sabbatical cycle. It's in the one, two, three, fourth year. And it happens at Passover time. Okay, go to Sodom and Gomorrah, 18, uh, 1800s. Nope, you're too, go back, go back, down, down, down. There you go. Okay, so Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed at the end of, uh, or in 1789. No, at the uh, Passover 1790, I'm sorry. It's in the sixth sabbatical cycle. It's in the third year of the sixth sabbatical cycle. But again, it's at Passover time. What happens is, as a, so it says in Luke, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the last days. Go to the sixth sabbatical cycle now, Randy, our time. There you go. On the sixth sabbatical cycle, you see the year 2033? I've marked 2033 in blue on purpose. Because in the fall holy days, which we're going to talk about in the next hour, the fall holy days, there's the eighth day feast at the end of the seven days of Sukkot. The eighth day feast is a similar is similar in teaching to the Jubilee year. So I just made the eighth day feast in the Jubilee year 2045. And I counted back seven days or seven years for the Feast of Tabernacles, which brought me to 2038. Five days or five years before the Feast of Tabernacles is the year 2033. The Day of Atonement is the five days before the Feast of Tabernacles. The Day of Atonement is when Satan's going to be locked away. And I'm starting to see a pattern here. Now, there's more. We don't have time for it today. There's a lot more. But 2033 is when Satan's going to be locked away. Now, Satan's locked away at the end of the Great Tribulation, which begins three and a half years before that. Three and a half years before the Great Tribulation brings you to Passover of 2020. I mean, 2030. I'm sorry. Passover 2030. That's when the two witnesses are killed. But they are working for three and a half years before that, which brings you to uh, the Feast of Trumpets or the Day of Atonement in 2026. And they're going to say not any rain is going to fall anywhere in the world for three and a half years. And by these plagues, one quarter and then a third of mankind are going to die. That's 50% of the world's population are going to die in these coming years. There's approximately 8 billion, so that's about 4 billion people are going to die. How many of them are going to be Filipinos? That depends entirely on you. That depends entirely on whether you're going to go out and tell people this message, because we're recording it. I'll make it available to you. You can read it over. We have all this information on my website, sightedmoon.com. You can go there and get it and you can teach it. How many Filipinos are going to die? Oh. I'm trying to get there. 
I'm trying to warn President Duterte. I'm telling the Belkakas who are up there, how many Filipinos are going to die? You need food, you need water, but more than that, you need to be obeying God. Because if you're not, he's going to let you die. So 2026 is now five years from today. Just five years from today. And in that time, you're going to see Israel being destroyed. Step by step until this plague, God says in Deuteronomy, these plagues will not leave us. I'm going to make them cling to you until you, excuse me, again, until you are destroyed. So my question to you is how many Filipinos are going to die? And Ezekiel says, if you see the sword coming and you don't tell anybody, if you don't say nothing, if you shut up and just be quiet, those people are going to die. But I will require their blood at your head. What that means is if you can prove, if you see what I'm saying to be the truth, then you must tell people. Otherwise, so that, well, you got to say something so that their blood is not on your hands. I hate that verse. That's why I have to do what I'm doing. Why doesn't anyone support this work so that we can get this message out to everybody and everybody know it? I don't care if you're that 18 year old in the back row. I don't care if you're the mom in the second row and you've been fussing with the kids. I don't care if you're a dad and you're worked to death with a job. I don't care. Each of you has a responsibility to go and tell others. And if they don't listen, go and find others that will. This information is available on my website. Help yourself to it. And if I can help you, please don't hesitate to ask. I want to thank you for allowing me to share this with you. I'll be back in the next hour to teach you another lesson here. Uh, you may not like it as much, but we have very little time. And we have to get things going. So... Uh, thank you, and I want to thank Pastor Rafi and Leo for putting this on so that I can present it. Um, again, you can always write me, sightedmoon.com, and I'll answer any of your questions. Okay, so... I will return to questions and answers later on as we will try to write it down. Kasi mag-break muna tayo ngayon. Okay, John, we will have a break. Uh, you would like the questions and answers later on? We have 15 minutes break, please. Okay. Uh, okay, please. How long a break? Uh, 10 minutes, 15? Yeah. Uh, how long a break? Uh, this one is to be right down the question and answer. So please, uh, what's the matter? Would you like to pray for the break? Heavenly Father, thank you very much for that wonderful teaching that we heard from our brother, Dumont. Lord, uh, thank you, and so with this uh, Maria, that, oh God, that we are about to say, oh God, thank you for the bounty of your kingdom, and we give you all the glory, the highest adoration and praise, Father, amen. in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, amen, amen. 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 Yeah. Okay, ask the new for water. 
Shalom, everyone. Welcome. Um, we are doing this recording for Leo uh, in northern uh, Philippines in the locals. Uh, I, I forgot the name of the town. Um, we've lost him. The, the connection has dropped. So I'm going to record this for him and hopefully we can get it to him and they can use it later. Uh, he may come back in. If he does, we'll just start over again. Uh, we'll see what happens. We don't know. This is this is the way things are. So he wanted me to talk about this verse in uh, Matthew 24, uh, verse 36, and Mark 13, verse 32. But concerning the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, of the, but the Father only. And the reason he wanted me to talk about this was because we just presented to you about the uh, sabbatical and jubilee years. We showed you from the beginning of Adam all the way to our time now. We're showing you that in 2033, Satan's going to be locked away. And the tribulation begins before that. And the two witnesses, three and a half years before that, which brings us. COVID-19 started, which we've been telling you was coming in 2020. And we've been telling you that for 15 years. Well, no one can know the day or the hour, therefore you're a false prophet. And that's what a lot of people say. And, but when they say that, and if you're saying that, then you're in trouble. Because the people that say that don't know that they're in trouble. Oh, we're going to start over again. You hit, hit the pause there, Randy, for a second. Okay, everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome back there, uh, Leo, and uh, the rest of you up. And I forgot the name of the town you're in. Pacao? Pacao? Rafi? What town are you in? Baggy. Baggy. Yeah. Okay. So welcome back. You've asked me to talk about what I've written in this book. So we're going to, again, we're going to highlight some parts of it. Uh, after I do a presentation like I just did, I usually talk about, uh, well, people usually talk about uh, that it's impossible to know the day or the hour. They say that you're a false prophet because you, you no one can know the day or the hour. And they're quoting Matthew 24, verse 36, or Mark 13, verse 32. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the son, but the father only. So if you are one of those people that are saying this, that I can't know the end of this age because that's what Jesus said, then my message to you is you are in danger. You're in grave danger. You're in trouble. Because he's telling you something here and you don't understand it. In Matthew 13, uh, no, Mark, yeah, Matthew 13, 34, Matthew 13, 34, Matthew 13, verse 34. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable did he not speak to them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Why does he do that? Most people today think that when he spoke in parables, it was so that we could understand it. Mark 4, verse 34. Mark 4, verse 34. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. Jesus never spoke unless he spoke through parables. He was not speaking so that they could understand. What? And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Even the disciples didn't understand it. Why does he do that? 
Why? Jeremiah 5.21. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes. Now, who's Jeremiah talking to? Judah, the Jews, people who are supposed to be keeping the Bible, keeping the Torah. Who have eyes, but see not. Who have ears, but hear not. I could say the same thing to you people. I could say the same thing to any church congregation anywhere in the world right now. Ezekiel 12, verse 2. The word of the Lord came to me. Ezekiel 12, verse 2. Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see, but see not, who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. So as I'm reading these things, you have to check your own heart. Are you rebelling? And I know I'm talking to Filipinos here, and they love God. I know that. And they love Jesus. I know that. The question you have to ask is, are you going to obey them? Will you obey them? Let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 18. Psalm 119, verse 18. And this is a prayer that I want all of us to just stop a moment and just stop fussing, doing what you're doing, just stop and pause. And I want you to pray this prayer right now. Our Father, Creator, our God in heaven, our Father, Jehovah, the maker of the entire universe, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things in your love. Father, open the eyes so that everyone listening to this, so open their eyes so they can see your truth and understand the things that are obvious that are hidden in the parables. Open our eyes that we may see. The disciples did not understand. We read this in the uh, in Mark chapter eight, starting verse sixteen. Well, we can let's start. Let's. I'm going. To, okay, I'll start there. I'll, they're jumping around. Mark 8, verse 16. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive to, or understand? They were with him, and they did not yet understand. Are your hearts hardened? Have Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears? Do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the bread for the 5,000 or the, the broke when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, for him, seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? How many of you read your Bible? Well, there's a question in itself. How many of you read your Bible? I'm not, I'm not asking you to go and listen to somebody read it to you. I'm asking you, how many of you read your Bible by yourself when you're alone between just you and God? Do you not understand what you're reading? I do not want any of you to believe anything I'm saying. That's why we quote the scriptures. That's why I'm telling you where they are. So you can go look at them. And I want you to prove what I'm saying to be true or what I'm saying to be false. But you got to prove it. And if you have somebody tell you, then you're not proving it. You're just taking someone else's as your witness. 
The apostles didn't understand what Yeshua was saying. They were confused. And he was questioning, why don't you understand? Why are you so thick in the head? You know, we make fun of the apostles all the time, thinking that we're smarter than them. We're not. We're not. I already did that. Luke 24, verse 45. Luke 24, verse 45. Come on. Luke 24, 45. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Who did that? Jesus did. So that's what you, we just prayed, open my eyes. So now I want you all to pray that prayer all the time. Father Jehovah, Father God, open my eyes so I can understand what I'm reading. Help me to understand this. We're at the end of this age. Help me to understand. Yeah. Open our eyes. So, Again, I've just shown you the sabbatical and jubilee years, and I've shown you that we are at the end of this age. And in Joel, and I forgot to write down the scripture, it says that, in, I believe it's Deuteronomy 14, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh in these last days. All flesh. That's not just the Jews. That's not just the Israelites. That's not just the, the North Americans. It's all flesh. It's every Filipino has that Holy Spirit being poured on them now. Every Chinese, every Vietnamese, every Cambodian, every Korean, every Japanese, every African, everybody has an opportunity to learn the Torah, to learn his laws now. But as I look around the world, there's only one nation that hungers after his Torah. It's the Philippines. Amen. amen. With that amen comes a responsibility. <laughs> if you know, if you know that you're being held accountable by God, if he's taken the branches and pulled them off the tree because they weren't producing fruit, he will also remove you. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Right? You know what I'm talking about. So you have a responsibility now to teach the rest of the Philippines. You don't have to go all the way down to Manila. You don't have to go all the way down to Manila. All you have to do is start teaching the people in your area so that your area is a hot spot for obeying God, so that your area is being blessed by God all the time. But it depends on you. So this part that Jesus is talking about, we're going to go to uh, Matthew 25. No one shall know the day or the hour. It's a parable. It's not a, well, it's not what you think it is. Because what he's actually telling you is the very moment he's going to come. Matthew 25. And we want to start not with what he said, because you're going to miss it. We're going to start in verse 1 of Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Who's the groom? Yeshua, Jesus. Who's the, the, the virgins? You and I. And everyone who goes to church and everyone who believes in Jesus or believes in God. In fact, you could even say everyone who's Muslim, everyone who believes in any God is one of these virgins because they're getting ready to marry the groom. 
So if you're one of these 10, the question you got to ask is, which one are you? Now, five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Well, everyone says that we are the wise ones. Because I'm not an idiot. I'm not stupid, right? I'm here to tell you, you possibly are stupid and not wise. I can say that because I'm on the other side of the ocean. You can't hit me with your stones right now. <laughs> right? The thing is, whether you are wise or foolish, right now, today, it matters, but it doesn't matter. What matters is what you do after today. What you do, do you become wise or do you remain foolish? That's your choice. And if you remain foolish, well, we know the story. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. What's the oil represents? That's the Holy Spirit. He's pouring out his flesh on, or his spirit on all flesh right now. All you got to do is reach out and want it. And read it. And study it. That's basically all you got. And pray. Open my eyes so I can understand, Father. Open my eyes so I can understand. I don't need Joe Dumont to tell me what it says. I don't need Pastor Rafi or Leo or some other pastor to tell me what it says. Open my eyes, Father, so I can understand it. But they took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They're reading the book. They're studying the book. So now listen carefully. But while the bridegroom was delayed, okay, we thought he was coming back right after he was killed in 2000 or 2000 years ago. He's delayed. They all fell asleep. Everyone fell asleep. And only recently has this movement begun to awaken, to see that we're coming. Leo's going around blowing the shofar. That's not some pleasant thing that makes you all feel Jewish and uh, closer and, you know, la la land. That's a warning. That's a warning. And some of you heard that blowing of the shofar and you answered the call and you have listened to them. And now we're talking here because you've heard this warning you want to understand. So that's awesome. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold. At midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Leo, give me some of your oil. Pastor Rafi, give me some of your oil. How are you going to do that? You can't. But the wise answered saying, no, lest we should, or lest there should not be enough oil for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy your, for yourselves. So people give me, you know, they try and tell me I'm a bad person because I sell my books. I give away a lot of books to those who ask and ask nicely. But it's telling you here to go and buy the oil. Go and buy the information so you can understand. Go and buy your Bible so you can understand. Go and pay somebody to teach you so you can understand. But make sure you pay for someone that's good at teaching you and not somebody that's bad. You go and buy it. You got to go and buy your oil. That means you got to put out money. That means you got to spend money to understand. You got to spend money to learn. But how fast can you learn? Can you learn everything that you need to learn in five minutes? Because this oil that he's talking about is the oil <laughs> of experience. You cannot buy this oil with a $10 bill. You have to experience it. You have to go through these events wow. to understand. 
Not all of you are going to be a thief on the tree. So you have to go through it. You have to go through the cycle and you have to understand these things and you learn by doing. What does James say? I will show you my faith by my works. He also says that works without faith and faith without works is dead. They need each other. But the wise answer saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They're out there trying to get their oil. They know he's coming, but they're not ready. They didn't buy enough oil. They didn't spend enough time learning about him. Because this is where you learn about God. This is where you learn about Jesus. This is where you learn what he expects of you. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. Afterwards, the Lord, afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As surely as I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you. And you've just spent your whole life at that church, doing the rituals of that church, thinking that that church was the right church to be in. And you had your pew, the third one from the front, your chair over by the window. You've sat there for 30 years. You thought you were ready. And you were not. And you will know whether or not you're ready because you'll know the meaning of the expression, no man knows the day or the hour. The wise knew they were ready. Do you know what the day and the hour means? If you do, then you're pretty close to being ready. If you don't, if you don't know what that expression means right now, and you're sitting there, I can't see you. But if you don't know what that means, that means that you're not ready. And that's pretty scary. He's going to come and he's going to say possibly to you, I never knew you. So let's jump from there. Okay, no, let me finish what he's saying. Watch therefore, for you do not know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So there it is. You do not know the day and hour the Son of Man is coming. But the wise knew. We read about Paul. Paul saying uh, to the Thessalonians, I believe it is, there's no need for me to talk to you about the seasons of his coming. You already know them. If the Thessalonians knew the seasons, how come you don't? How come I know this Jubilee cycles and I know when he's coming? If I know that, then you shouldn't be going around saying, well, Joe's a false teacher. He can't know that because of what this says. You should be saying, I don't know that. I want to know that so that I can be amongst the wise virgins and be part of that wedding. Go back to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. And I think it's verse 25. First, uh, verse 20. Let's start in verse 20 or 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. How's your fruit? Are you doing anything with it? Are you doing a work? Are you sitting there just being a bumping log, just getting by? Or are you helping people understand? Are you studying his Bible? Therefore, uh, by their fruits, you will know them. By their fruits, you'll know them. What fruits? I will show you my faith by my works. That's your fruits. If you say you have faith, no works, you're a liar. Verse 21, listen carefully. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he 
who does the will of my father. So now the question is, what is the will of my father? What is my father's will? Well, first John tells you what the father's will is. Okay, you're waiting for me to tell you? No, go and look it up. Read all of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Read them. Those are the ones most churches don't read. But here's the clue. Here's the will of my Father, that you keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not prophesied in your name have we not cast out demons in your name have we not done many mighty wonders have we not built great big mega churches we've got six thousand people coming to our morning service we got six thousand people coming to our afternoon service and you're going to say no to us and then i will declare to them I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What? Who's practicing lawlessness? Well, the churches are all saying the law is done away with, so I guess it's the churches. You who practice lawlessness. Who's saying this? Jesus. And many churches say Jesus fulfilled the law. Therefore, the law is done away. Therefore, we don't have to keep the laws. Therefore, it's okay to commit adultery. No. Therefore, it's okay to commit murder. No. Therefore, it's okay to be a false witness. No. Therefore, it's okay to covet. No. Uh, therefore, it's okay to what? Dishonor your mother and your father. No. Therefore, it's okay to bow down to statues. If you're in the Catholic Church, it is. No, it's not. It's not okay to do that. Therefore, it's okay to, to take God's name in vain. No, it's not okay. to. So what's the commandments that are nailed to the cross that are done away with? It's the fourth one that nobody wants to do. And because they don't do the fourth one, they don't understand the saying, no man shall know the day or the hour. Therefore, that parable goes right over their head, and they're stuck there saying, Lord, Lord, please let us in. We did all these things. Come on. We're such good people. We've gone and served in the soup kitchen. We fed the poor. We've done all these things. The only thing they haven't done was obeyed them. Let's go to 1 John. Okay, because here's your homework. I want you to read all of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But 1 John 3, verse 4. Where's 1 John? Where'd you go? First John has fallen out of my Bible. There you are. 1 John 3, verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. Remember, he just said, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So what laws are you not keeping? Well, the Ten Commandments are nailed to the cross. We don't have to keep them. Then you're lawless. What is the will of God? That you keep his commandments. What did Jesus say? Those who say they love me and keep not my commandments are liars and the truth is not in them. So if you're saying the commandments are done away with, then you're a liar. If your pastor or the bishop or the cardinal, whoever it is that's teaching you is saying that, then they're liars. And because they're saying that and because you're obeying that, you're one of the foolish ones who don't know what that expression means to no man shall know the day or the hour. So you need to stop and do a gut check right now. I'm not telling you this so that you follow me. 
I'm not telling you this so that you leave your pastors, you leave your churches. I want you to go back to them and I want you to teach them. And I want you to teach your entire um, Barang, is, am I saying the right word? Your entire province. If you don't, that drought that's coming by the two witnesses in five years time is gonna wipe out your community. COVID-19 is going to flare back up and your community is going to get struck. The war is going to start and your community is going to get bombed. You pick the curse. They're coming. But the Philippines has a role to perform here. So I know that the Philippines is going to be blessed, but we need more of you to be obedient to God. You want to understand what that's saying? No man knows the day or the hour. Okay. Leo, how am I doing for time? We've got still got a good amount of time. I'm off my notes. We're now just off my notes. I'm free will and I don't know where I've lost my spot in the notes here. Okay. You know, I don't care what faith you are. You know that Jesus was killed on Passover. Where do you find that information about Passover? You go to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. And you'll see that he was killed at Passover. Now, everyone just kept Passover. And we're very, you know, we mourn when we watch the Passion of Christ. We mourn when we see the, him being whipped. We're feeling really bad. We, re, you know, we're supposed to be repenting. But in Leviticus 23, it says... Um, where to go here? You shall count no count for yourselves. No, that's the wrong one. Um, the way she Randy, help me out. There it is. Verse five, Leviticus twenty three, verse five. On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So on Passover, that's when the death angel passed over, uh, and in the Exodus, and all the people left Egypt. And then at the end of those seven days, on the seventh day of unleavened bread, that's when the Red Sea opened up and then closed up and destroyed the Egyptian army, the greatest army on earth at that time. These things happen at each of the holy days for a reason, because the, the holy days in Hebrew is the word moedim, which means appointments. When you have a doctor's appointment, you show up, I don't know about in the Philippines, but here in Canada, if we don't go to the doctor's point, we are charged. So we show up. We will take time off of work to go to a dentist appointment. You had an appointment today with Leo to be here to listen to me talk. So you've shown up. Those are Moedim. Those are appointments. So these days in Leviticus 23 are appointments with God that you get to come and learn about him and be with him. And what does he say you know, to the five foot, I never knew you. How do you get to know God? It, by buying his oil. How do you get the oil? By going through each of these holy days over the course of a year, which requires you to take the time over a year to go through them. So when he's coming to the door to take his bride and you haven't done any of this stuff, it's too late because you don't have time to go back over the year and learn these things. So he's killed on Passover and the Red Sea opens and closes on the seventh day. There's whole other implications there that we don't have time to get into, I don't think, today. And then you start counting from Wave Sheaf Day. What's Wave Sheaf Day? Wave Sheaf Day is the, well, where is it? It's right here. You show... Um, First day, and you shall offer, verse 8, but uh, you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. Uh, no, that's not it. And verse 9, 10, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, you shall reap its harvest, and then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord and be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So the day after the Sabbath, that's the Sunday morning. Jesus was in the grave Wednesday night, 
He was killed Wednesday afternoon. We can prove that. Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. He was in the grave for three nights. He was in the grave all day Thursday, all day Friday, and all day Saturday. He was in the grave three days and three nights. And at the end of the Sabbath, the seventh day, which is hugely significant, he came out of the grave. And sunset that day is the beginning of the first day of the week. And on sunset that day, well, let's just go Matthew 27. I don't know if you guys have ever read this part. Matthew 27. And Matthew's the only one that records it. Matthew 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So that's when he died. That's the Wednesday. And then, verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Again, that's the Wednesday. Verse 52, and the graves were opened, that's the Wednesday, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, again, that was the Wednesday, they were raised up, they were marked, the same way we're about to mark the wave sheaf, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, so that's Saturday night, and they went into the holy city and appeared to many, so a lot of people saw them, what did they, what just happened? This is big deal stuff. So you go back to Leviticus 23, and he shall wave the wave sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. That's a Sunday morning. That's when these people are, are coming out of the grave. What does Mary Magdalene, when she goes to the grave, she says, gardener, tell me where the body of my Savior is, and I will take him away. And what does Jesus say to her? He says, Mary. And right away, she knows that it's Yeshua. And she goes to hug him. And what does he say to her? Don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to my father. That's what he was going to do Sunday morning at the wave offering because the first fruits of the barley, the first fruits of the wave sheaf is what he represents. And these saints who came out of the grave are the first fruits. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Enoch, Moses, Elijah. The first fruits that came up with them. Again, if you read in Revelations, Revelations, it talks about the 24 elders. The word elders means ancestors. How did they get to heaven? When you die, you don't go to heaven. You go to sleep. Jesus said, no man's gone to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. No one's gone to heaven before him. Not Abram, Isaac, Moses, not Elijah, not Enoch. It says in the Hebrews that all these died in the faith. This wave sheaf day is big stuff. It's the first time people came out of the grave and went to heaven. Our ancestors. It's a wow moment. And if you understand how big a moment that is, then that's the wave sheaf day, which isn't even a holy day. It's just a wave sheaf day. But from that day, we count 50 days to the Feast of Pentecost. Okay? So the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost Sunday. So it's telling you something. Wave sheaf day happens on the eighth day. Pentecost Sunday happens on the eighth day. Pentecost Sunday is also the eighth <coughs> Sabbath. So that's also like the 50th Jubilee year. All these things are telling you something. They're telling you how to get to know God. And if you don't keep them, you won't know him. And when he says, I don't know you, then you'll know why, because you're not obeying. I never knew you because you never obeyed. So what if, 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 if these guys came out of the grave at, at Passover time on wave sheaf day, what does Shavuot mean? That's when everyone who's died since then, since Jesus came out of the grave, the apostles and everyone, all the saints up until this time now, that's when Paul says, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. The dead will rise first, and those of us alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. This is the rapture that everybody's talking about. 
They just don't know when it is because they don't know God. They don't obey him. And because they don't do that, they don't understand that the rapture is going to take place on Pentecost Sunday. And we know in Revelations that the saints, 144,000, and there's a whole bunch of others besides them, are going to be raised up at the end of the tribulation. And if we know that the tribulation is going to end at the Day of Atonement in 2033, then that means that the tribulation in 2033, the rapture is going to take place when all of us who are obeying will be raised up. You have time to obey. You have time to get that oil ready now. You still got time. But very little time. That's why Pentecost is so important. Because if you, do, if you understand Passover, then Pentecost takes on a whole new meaning. That's when we're going to be raised up. On the Feast of Pentecost, there were trumpets blasting when God came down and landed on Mount Sinai. God, trumpets blasting, blowing, you know, Pedro and Leo blow those. That's what's going on today, lightning. And the people were shaking. And oh, they were scared. That's the trumpets when we will be changed at Shavuot, at Pentecost. And God also said, I am the same today, yesterday, and forever. And in Hebrews, or it, I'm getting them mixed up. I change not. So if he doesn't change, why are you doing away with his Ten Commandments, which he gave at Mount Sinai? And he made a big deal of it because he did that on Shavuot or on Pentecost Sunday. That represents, that law represents the law of his kingdom. That represents God's heart. That's who he is. He gave the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday to the apostles. That same Holy Spirit is being poured out on you right now. Right now. Amen. What are you going to do with it? So if that Holy Spirit is poured out on Pentecost Sunday and the law was given on Pentecost Sunday, then that means that they are connected together and they go together. They go together. They're not like this. They go together. What did we pray about before? Pray that your eyes will be opened. Pray that you will see. You got to ask this prayer. I can ask it for you, but you got to ask for it. Because he's not going to force you to love him. He wants you to love him. But he's also going to say to some people, I never knew you because you didn't obey. Okay, so that's the spring feast and the summer feast of Pentecost. So now we come into the Feast of Trumpets. And you ask the Jews today, what does the Feast of Trumpets mean? It means the Feast of Shouting. It means the Feast of <clears throat> Blowing the Shofars. What does it mean, though? And they will tell you they don't know. You ask Christians what it means. They don't know. The Feast of Trumpets comes on the very first day of the seventh month. Now, in the, the Hebrew calendar, the month is determined by the first sighting of the sliver. The moon is a faithful witness, which means you have to see it. A dark moon or a conjunction moon, you can't see. So that first sliver of the new moon, it can be either on this day or the next day. We just don't know which day it's going to be on. And I just gave you the secret to understanding no man shall know the day or the hour. Because it's determined by the crescent moon in the first day of the seventh month. And that first day of the seventh month is called the Feast of Yom Teruah, the day of shouting, the day of blowing the trumpets. Why? Why? What are we shouting about? Because on this day, you read in Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, it's the day when Jesus was born. That's why we're shouting. Our Messiah is here. He's come. He's come. He's here. It's not Christmas. 
It's the Feast of Trumpets. God told you when to keep it here. Uh, which verse am I looking for? I want Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24. Speak to the children of Israel in the seventh month. On the first day of the month, you shall have a, whole, uh, a Sabbath rest, a memorial blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire. In Christianity, we all want Jesus to come back. We're anxiously looking for it. Everyone's looking for the rapture to take place. They're not understanding the rapture about Pentecost Sunday because they don't keep those. Holy, they're nailed to the cross. They're done away. We don't have to keep them no more. And because you don't have to keep them, you're ignorant. And because you don't keep them and you're ignorant, you're going to be told, I never knew you. And the Feast of Trumpets represents the day and hour no man can know. We cannot know that day. Every year when we keep that day, we never know which day it's going to be on. And people look at us like you're insane. You don't know your own holy days when they're going to be. Yes, we don't know. And that's what Yeshua was saying when he said, no man shall know the day or the hour. Because the same day that he came on when he was born, the Feast of Trumpets, is the same day he's going to come back on in the future on the Feast of Trumpets. And that is a hallelujah, wow, awesome revelation, because for many people, they never knew that, never even understand it. So that's the, that's the first day of the seventh month. Now, let's, what's, what's next? Verse 27, Leviticus 23, and also on the 10th day of the seventh month, you shall, or sorry, also the 10th day of the, this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. This is a very important day. And I'm going to take a couple of minutes and explain it to you why it's so important. For many persons, uh, for any person who has not afflicted his soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. This day means you don't eat, you don't drink. It's a 24-hour fast from sunset to sunset. He's going to tell you that. Any person who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall, in, you shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. No, it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. You shall afflict your soul on the ninth day of the month at evening, which is sunset. From evening, from sunset to sunset, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. So at the end of the ninth to the end of the tenth, you are to fast. Why? What does this day represent? What is the plan, the whole plan of salvation? Let me go to Leviticus 16. I want you to read this in Leviticus 16. I hope I can get right to the right verse. Leviticus 16. Randy, go and find me the corresponding verse in chapter in Revelation, please. I believe it's 20. Just give me the help with that verse. Uh, verse Leviticus 16, verse 7. And he, this is talking about the Day of Atonement. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots. So even the high priest, Aaron, doesn't know which goat is which. Okay, think about this really carefully now. The two goats are similar. Who do they represent? And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats. One lot for the Lord. Okay, that word Lord is Jehovah. One goat represents Jehovah. And the other lot for the scapegoat. The scapegoat has been twisted in our terminology. It's not the one who got away with doing it. The scapegoat is the guilty party. The scapegoat, the Azazel goat, is Satan. And on this Satan, on this goat that represents Satan, we're going to put all the sins of the world, everything that he brought into the world, he's the one who introduced it. And then a strong man's going to take him off into the wilderness. You can read that in the rest of Leviticus 16. Randy, what verse am I going to in Revelation here? Go to Revelation. Uh, verse 7, when he's locked away. Verse Chapter 20? Yes, sir. Chapter 20, verse 7. 
No. Uh, chapter 20, verse 1. Let's go to chapter 20, verse 1. Okay, so you just, I want you to go back. You got some homework. Go back and read Leviticus 16. When you read Leviticus 16, then go and read Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. That's the strong man who takes this as as I'll go out to the mountain to throw it off. And he's told, he laid hold of the dragon, Satan, the Azazel goat, that serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So Satan's going to be bound up for the entire millennium. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. So at the end of the thousand years, he's let loose. And then he's going to go through this again. Then he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Right? This is the day of atonement. This is what this day represents. This is the day when Satan would be locked away. But go back here. Who's the other goat? It's not Jesus. It's Jehovah. It's God. And God is the word that became flesh. And we call him Jesus when he became flesh. But Jesus is God. In Isaiah, it says, I am Jehovah. There I am your Yeshua. So in the Hebrew, Jesus is the word Hebrew in Hebrew is Yeshua. I am Jehovah. I am your Yeshua. This day of atonement, God's telling us that he will give his life so that we don't have to pay the penalty that we're supposed to pay. The penalty that you're supposed to pay is death for not obeying God. He's already paid that penalty for you. All you got to do is repent and begin to obey, and he will forgive you. Okay, so this is part of the cleansing process, and we're getting ready for what? We're getting ready for the wedding. Again, go back, I lost my spot. Leviticus 23, go back to Leviticus 23 again. And we're going to read in, we just read about the Day of Atonement. Five days after the Day of Atonement is the Feast of Sukkot. Uh, speak verse chapter Leviticus 23, verse 34. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The 15th day of this seventh month shall be a Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall no, do no work. This is God telling you to take a vacation every year and come and worship him. If you read in Deuteronomy, God says, take 10% of your income and put it in your pocket and come and keep the feast with me. God's saying, take a tithe and pay it to yourself so that you can come to me wherever that is in Jerusalem or anywhere and keep the feast. And you're going to party with that money. You're going to eat the best food. You're going to drink hard liquor. You're going to drink wine. You're going to dance. And if you're a Baptist, I'm sorry, but that's what your Bible says, because I know Baptists don't like to dance and drink. And God's saying, do this so that you worship me. And what are you doing? You're practicing for the wedding that you all want to go to. And then at the end of the wedding, it says, uh, is the eighth day. And this is another day. It just tells you there's an eighth day. Shimini Atzeret is what it's called in Hebrew. But they don't know what it means. And the answer to that in Hebrew is found in Re Revelations again. So you can read from Revelation chapter 20 all the way to the end. And that's what the eighth day is. The eighth day represents the eighth millennium. We're about to begin the seventh one of rest. And the eighth day represents Pentecost or, or the wave chief day from at Passover. Pentecost Sunday and the Jubilee year all combined. Because the eighth day represents a time when God is going to come down from heaven and dwell with man here on earth. No more day, no more night, no more Satan because he's put away at the end of the seventh millennium. This is the wedding feast. This is the wedding day. This is the consummation of the wedding when we go to live with God. No man shall know the day of the hour. 
It's a Hebrew idiom, a Hebrew ism, telling you of the very day and hour that he's going to come back on, the Feast of Trumpets, which no man can know the day or hour of until they sight the moon. That's why we need two witnesses. So the five foolish virgins don't know any of this stuff that I've just explained to you. They don't know the day or the hour because they don't keep the Feast of Trumpets. They don't know who the, the, the goat that represents Satan. They don't know when that day is going to take place. That's 2033, which we just showed you in the Jubilee Cycles. The rapture at Pentecost Sunday. They don't know when that is. It could be any time. We don't know. It's Pentecost Sunday. You would know that if you kept the holy days. We're going to marry our groom. That's the Feast of Sukkot. That's why it's such a big party every year. You get the party with God. You don't have to do any of these things I just said. You can carry on doing whatever it is you're doing. You just don't have to obey. But know for certain he's coming and he's going to say to those people who don't obey, I never knew you. And those who don't obey do not know what it means. No man shall know the day or the hour. So I will end it there. And there's more. Again, we have all this and a whole bunch more in this book. You're free to, you know, free, we have it in our newsletters for free. The book is going to cost money because it costs money for the book. But if you can't afford the book, write me. And we'll do something else. I will get you the book. So... Leo, do you have your shofar blast? Because the shofar blast represents the Feast of Trumpets. Would you just blow the shofar, let them hear the shofar that's going to be sounded on the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no man can know. Go. No one will know the day or hour, but now all of you do. All of you do know that day and hour now. All of you know what that mean, means and what it represents. And all of you now can become part of the wise versions. All you got to do is start obeying. So uh, I'm done. I want to thank you again. I want to thank Leo and Pastor Rafi for hosting this and allowing me to present this information. I know it's a lot of information. Um, again, you get more understanding by going to read our stuff at sightedmoon.com. What I've just presented to you in a couple hours is a 40-hour teaching. We have it all in our videos. They take you through it step by step, so please go there. If you have questions, you can write me at sightedmoon, admin at sightedmoon.com, and I will answer them personally. I don't have a whole bunch of people doing it. Um, I'm here to help. And if you have questions here today, I will take your questions now. Um, again, and I thank you. Leo, do you, I don't know what you want to do. Do you want to ask a closing yeah, question? Yeah, so you will write it later on. Because it's like that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Okay, there's a question here, uh, Joe. What event yeah. take place in the year 2029? What prophecy in the year 2029? In 2029, this is where the Philippines kicks in the gear. The 12 tribes of Israel will have been decimated. They will have been slaughtered. There will only be a remnant left of the 12 tribes. And the Philippines, according to Isaiah, is supposed to go and rescue the, the, them. And at the same time, the Philippine people are supposed to be teaching the Torah to the nations. I believe this is Isaiah 60 or 65. And 
So in, in 2029, you will be bringing back the remnant of Israel to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, and you will present them there as a wave offering, which we just talked about, and getting ready for 2030. And then in 2030, the two witnesses will be killed, and you and the remnant of Israel will flee into Moab. So here's a question you have to ask. In Revelation, it talks about the woman who flees into the wilderness, and the earth opens up and swallows the army that's chasing the woman. And then the beast power, I believe I'm in Revelation 12 right now, and the beast power goes and turns and makes war on the remnant who keep the commandments. So those people who are keeping the commandments didn't flee with the woman into Moab or into Jordan. And my question is why? So that's another teaching, but that's what's going on here at 2029, 20, 2030. Again, there's so much. Okay. There's another one. In the 70th week under the fourth cycle, what kind of war will be happening? I'm sorry, Leo, say that again. The fourth sabbatical cycle, what? Yeah, in the 70th week under the fourth cycle, what kind of war will happen? If you look at the fourth sabbatical cycle and you begin to compare it, and we didn't do that today, we just didn't have time. You compare the fourth sabbatical cycle with the fourth millennium, when the temple was built and destroyed, when Jesus is killed on the fourth day of the week, um, when Israel was destroyed in the fourth sabbatical cycle, which is uh, uh, corresponds to our time now. There's a number of things taking place to indicate that destruction is coming to us now. We've just gone through the blood moons of 2014 and 2015 from the time of Adam's death, and we've documented this, we have another teaching on that, the blood moons uh, that came at Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles in 2014, again in 2015 at the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Passover, and again a dark moon came at the Feast of Passover and Tabernacles in 2016, and a dark moon is a very dark yellowy orange. Whereas the blood moon is full red blood moon. A blood moon is a sign of war coming. And a dark moon is a sign of famine coming. And the fourth curse of the fourth sabbatical cycle is sword and famine and plague. These are the same three curses that God offered King David when he took a census. You can have sword, famine, or plague. And David chose plague. And then at the end of that plague, David saw the angel standing over the uh, over Jerusalem. And that's when David knew to buy the altar spot. And that began the building of the altar. Could this plague lead into the building of the altar in Jerusalem? Because Satan has to come sit in the throne of God. Is that what's about to take place very soon? It could very well be. I don't know that part yet. So we are looking for a sword to come in the four sabbatical cycle. Sword, famine, and plague. Plague came first. Okay, that's so wonderful. Yes, please. Maybe this will be the last question. Then we go. I'm Oh, okay. I was wondering why I couldn't understand it. I'm sorry. I, I couldn't. Okay, 
what is mentioned is that if you don't keep the fourth commandment, and we break the whole law. And if you say we love him and don't obey his commandment, they are under court liar. Is that true, Joe? I'm I, I'm not sure I'm understanding. If we break the fourth commandment, we break the whole law. And if we break the fourth commandment, Jesus is saying we're a liar. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, John mentioned that if we don't keep the commandment, then we are. Um, if we if we say we know him but don't keep the commandment, then we are a liar. That's right. You know, that's if you if you say you love me and you keep not my commandments, then you're a liar. So I'm not, you know. It's not me saying it, it's your Bible. You're, you know, if Leo, if you want to get that verse and read it in Filipino, that's fine. It's the same thing in Filipino as it is in English. If you don't keep my commandments, then you're a, a liar. We love Jesus. We, we love Jesus. Well, and we believe on the name of Jesus. Well, the word when, in Romans, that word believe, if you look it up in the Greek, means you repent and turn back to keeping the covenant. Those who confess the name of Jesus, that word confesses, return and keep the covenant. Okay, if the if the commandments are nailed to the tree, then there's no more sin. Okay, that's that's a very broad subject now about the keeping yes. the commandment. <laughs> okay, because the actually the Sabbath is connected to all the so if we those, go, and if the we salvation go. plan and the millennium, I mean the sabbatical year, because this sabbatical cycle that you mentioned is it is repeated. Every is <coughs> major event are done during the holidays. This oh. holidays is the Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Okay. Leo? All the major events in history from the time of Adam, this major event happened on those specific. Yes, please. If if you guys could all open up your Bible again and read Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, okay, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short. Okay, so this is talking about the millennium of rest, which is right in front of us, the seventh millennium. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So they, they didn't have faith. They didn't believe. You claim to have faith, so let's start to believe. For we who have believed, uh, for we who have believed, do enter that rest, as he has said, I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So what works did he do? The rest that he made at the creation of the world, the seventh day Sabbath rest. It's not Jewish. God made it from the very beginning before he even made man. For he has spoken in the certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest, which is not the Sabbath rest. It's talking about the seventh millennium of rest, which is just 23 years from now. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, Listen to what this guy is saying. Again, he, I'm losing my eyesight. He de designates a certain day saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today you will hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them a rest, then they would have not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. This is the seventh millennium. That you want to enter into. This is what the seventh day Sabbath represents. I'm the same today and yesterday and forever. I change not. So if he doesn't change, who changed the Sabbath? Right? 
Hebrews 4 is talking about the Sabbath that God made at the beginning of time and us entering into the seventh millennium, which is just 23 years from now. But if you're not going to keep the seventh day Sabbath, then you're not going to be keeping the seventh millennium Sabbath. Because that's what it represents. The same as the wave sheaf day or the eighth day and Pentecost Sunday, which is an eighth Sabbath, represents the eighth millennium when God comes to dwell with us, when all of us will be raised up to live with him. If we obey. Two biggest letters in the Bible. If. If we obey. Okay, to answer that more questions, are we allowed that? No. We just don't know. The whole concept of it. But in this last place, it will be revealed to us. But it's not good. We just don't know the whole answer of it. But these last days will be revealed to us. And it's up to now for us to respond. Thank you. We will have a last break. No, thank you. We will write to the center. For him and, of course, foremost, our adult brother. We now take maps um Robert, would you like to to read us in prayer for the maps? Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you, Leo, and shalom everybody. Thank you all for listening. Brother Doom, the MLG community is requesting if you can send a copy of this recording to our group so they can also watch this our recording. We can do that. Thank you. Thank you, yes, thank you please. Thank you. Okay.